Is someone's phone up here? Okay. Okay. Oh. Hi. Just start. Just start. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm not going to touch that. Um, good afternoon. People still sitting down. Take a seat. Come on in. <clears throat> Welcome to Midday Talk. Uh, if you haven't been here before, this is a lecture series that happens um, through this winter months. And uh, the talk welcomes people, different practitioners, to share their work here at the school with us. Do I have to stand? I can stand up. And uh, there's a few more coming up this term, so hopefully you'll take a look at the website and see what else is happening um, in the coming weeks. The series is curated by Vivian Lee, and uh, <clears throat> most of you know her. Um, she's an instructor here at, at the faculty, and she's founding partner of LAMAS, um, an interdisciplinary studio that focuses on um, issues of craft traditions and perception in architecture and the fine arts. Uh, I'm Victoria Taylor. I'm an adjunct um, instructor here and uh, here in the Masters of Landscape Architecture Department. And I run a small design practice here in Toronto. At VTLA, we uh, mostly work with private and um, commercial clients. Um, but deeply woven through my practice is an interest in contemporary art and pushing the potentials of sight uh, through materiality, planting design, and experience. And I do this through curations and temporary public space installations. So I hope you um, can look up my website and see more about what I do. Um, but I'm always interested to meet others who are similarly juggling this life of collaborations and um, creative explorations. So I was happy to be introduced to Julia and Corin in, um, I think it's 2016. And I was, um, when I was putting together an outline for a course um, where I want to look at um, the role of landscape architecture in this new genre of place-specific public art. And so they were helpful with me for that. And now three years later, I'm finally meeting you guys in person. And uh, before we get started, I'll just share a little bit uh, about their background. So Julie and Corin are Canadian designers. Um, artists and educators. They've collaborated together since 2003 and together they create spaces, objects and situations that interrupt the ordinary in critically engaging and playful ways. Their multidisciplinary practice operates at a variety of scales. From temporary installations to permanent public artworks and architectural projects. Their academic research focuses on the role of play in the built environment and alternative methods of documentation as a form of historic preservation. In 2018, the Architectural League of New York honored their work with the prestigious League Prize. Julia is an assistant professor and Corin is an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Architecture at the University of Buffalo, SUNY. Formerly, Corin was an architect at Herzog & de Meuron and a project director at Harry Guger Studio in Basel, Switzerland. Julia was also an architect at Herzog & de Meuron and taught architectural design studios at the ETH in Zurich. Julia holds a BA Honours from U of T and a Masters of Architecture from UBC and um, Corin also has a BA Honours from U of T and earned his MArc from MIT with a concentration in visual arts. So they've won numerous competitions. Um, they've exhibited in Canada, US, Germany, France, Italy, and South Korea, and including solo shows at V-Tape and Convenience Gallery here in Toronto. So on behalf of the whole school, I extend a warm welcome um, to you both, and thanks for being with us here today and to share, our work, share your work. Welcome. Do you want to sit on that one or this one? Mm -hmm. 
next one. Hello. Hello. Can you hear us? Yep. Good, okay. So my name's Julia Jamrozik. I'm Corin Kempster. Thank you for being here today. Thank you uh, to Victoria Taylor and to Vivian Lee for, uh, for the invitation. We're very happy to, to be able to share our work with you, especially um, since both Corin and I uh, went to U of T for our undergraduate studies. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so I was actually part of the, the first cohort that graduated from the new um, Bachelor of Arts with a concentration in architectural studies back in 2001. Um, and uh, you were followed shortly thereafter. Um, but that's, that's when we started working together, um, was um, obviously in, in studio, but also um, working with friends um, and uh, collaborators on a series of kind of sometimes unsolicited, sometimes solicited projects. These are a series of installations that we did uh, for the Images Festival in the atrium of, of Innes Hall. Um, and then <clears throat> we started toward the end of our time in, uh, in undergrad collaborating together uh, with Gabe Sawney uh, to make a series of video works. And I think maybe what's interesting is that these were actually all um, processed and, and put together here in this, not this building, but that building uh, in Connaught. Um, and I think, I don't know, we had a very fast look around the ground floor. Um, <laughs> there's Hi, Gabe. Gabe. Gabe is right there. Um, we, had, we had a little look around the ground floor, and it does look like the building has changed significantly. So, uh, but I know Kim will remember how creepy this building used to be. Um, so you'd be in the video lab, which was like on the top floor at three in the morning, but to get there, you'd go through the main door and there'd be like coolers on the floor full of eyeballs. Cause there was like a, an organ donor bank. And I remember one time passing an open door and there was a scientist standing over a, a mouse with its skull taken off and like electrodes in its brain and wires. And he was getting it to run through mazes. And it was just that kind of, yeah, the elevator used to be used to, to transport horses for medical experiments. So it was like a building with, with a lot of character, I guess. <laughs> Um, but it'll be interesting afterwards, I think, to, to see the, the full school mm -hmm. and see what, it, what it's been transformed. Uh, and then we wanted to show, also, so I, I don't know if you can see it here, actually, in the, in the background of this video. This was shot uh, just out front in the, in the kind of traffic circle, looking back at Connaught. Um, so, uh, I, I want to start by uh, talking about the, the lead prize that, that um, Victoria mentioned. I, I want to mention it only because um, we, so we, we graduated, we went off to grad school, then we went and worked, uh, Julia started teaching, and then a, a, num a few years ago we moved back to North America and started our own practice full time. And we sort of started this very, very intense breakneck period of of just saying yes to everything and, and doing as much as we possibly could. Um, and then last year when, when we were lucky enough to get the league prize, that was, um, and this, this is an image of the exhibition that, I, that accompanies that, um, it was a really good moment for us to kind of take stock and like just pause after kind of running, working breathlessly for, for three or four years. And, and really look back on the work we had done and try to understand for ourselves, like, what are we doing? What are the commonalities? How does it fit together or not fit together? Um, and then how do we use that framework to move forward and decide, like, what is the work we want to be doing? And maybe, hopefully, we're getting to a position where we can start um, saying no to some opportunities and being a bit more selective. So then, if we're going to do that, how do we shift our focus around to, to kind of um, uh, be working at kind of a larger project, I guess, um, through through the different projects? And so, for the for the prize, we came up with three categories. We we realized that all of the work we had been doing could be kind of fit under these three umbrellas that dovetailed nicely with our interests in art, in architecture, design, 
um, and a history. And so the three categories, we're going to use those to present our work today, which is why I bring all of this up. So we're going to talk about uh, expanded preservation and what that means to us, uh, domestic narratives, and social infrastructures. So first, expanded preservation. So this group of projects, um, in it, we, we try to examine a different way of looking at preservation or conservation, um, trying to embed personal experiences and um, trying to kind of re-document and represent um, what we see in terms of buildings, in terms of the urban fabric. Um, and these projects take on the form of um, photographic documentation, they take on the form of narratives, and they also take on the form of um, installations. And I'll show, we'll show three projects in this group. So the first in the series is a project we did actually in 2005. We were in Berlin for a year, and um, we, 2005, so it was the 15th um, year anniversary of reunification of Germany. And um, we found ourselves in the city and wanted to know it more and wanted to know its history a bit more. Um, and so we, what we did for this project is we walked the urban length of the Berlin Wall, or the place where the Berlin Wall used to be, so about 26 kilometers or so. Um, and we took photographs along the way. And so from each spot um, that we stopped, we took four photos. You can see them here, so one looking west, one looking east, one looking north, and one looking south. Um, and this became kind of a series of photos. And through this series, what we wanted to show was how this, this kind of gap in the city was healing or not healing, how the east and the west were the same or were different. And, um, and with the idea of kind of going back maybe 15 years on to, to see if that had changed. So it's a bit of a, a dated project in the sense it was before you know, Google, um, Google Street View and all that. Um, so now you could maybe drive this um, on your computer. But at the time, we decided to walk it ourselves. Another project in this series is a, is a permanent public artwork that we did um, for the Clearview Library in, in Edmonton, Alberta. And we think of this project as a bit of a portrait of the city. Um, what we wanted to do was um, was to document the, the demographic, the proportions um, of the population in the city um, that spoke different languages. and, and we did that through a kind of an analysis of the demographics and then mapped that onto the different alphabets um, that were spoken by um, the people in the city. Um, so this, this series of this you know, cloud of letters um, then became suspended um, over the bookshelves in the library. And it, in a very, very abstract way, um, it shows the kind of the demographics of the place at the time. So the the project in this category we, we're going to sort of focus the most on is something we've been working on since 2015 called Growing Up Modern. And it grew out of a visit that we made to the Villa Savoie. And we came across, there was a, a letter on display there from Madame Savoie to Le Corbusier, where she complained that his building gave her son pneumonia. And we, it sort of struck us that you know, in the history of architecture, a lot has, of course, been written about the buildings. A fair bit has been written about the architects. A little bit has been written about the clients. But as far as we knew, nobody had taken on the children and asked them what they thought. Um, so we, we tracked down a bunch of them. Um, we looked for uh, kids in Europe who had grown up in some of the most radical avant-garde settings as the original inhabitants. So these, for us, it had to be the very first kid to move in to the, to the house or the neighborhood. And so this is Madame Garon, who grew up in uh, Cite Fruges uh, by Le Corbusier in Pessac. Uh, Ralph Fassbender, who grew up in Aud's row houses in the Weissenhof Siedlung. Um, not sure <laughs> where to aim this to <laughs> get it to work. Uh, Ernst Tugendhat, who of course grew up in, in Mies van der Rohe's Tugendhat Villa. Uh, Helga Zumpfe, who grew up in, Schminke, in the Schminke House by Hans Scharoun. And Giselle Moreau, who grew up in the Unitem in Marseille by Corbusier. And so what, what we were interested in, in in talking to all of these kids, now of course very much adults, um, is we wanted to we, the hypothesis was their parents chose to live in that avant-garde setting. But of course, 
kids, as they always are, are just the unwitting guinea pigs, right, taken along for the ride. And as a result, you know, like, you could expect the parents to have drank the Kool-Aid and, and think that modernism was wonderful, but what would the kids have thought growing up in these, in these settings? And maybe we thought they might have a more raw, honest opinion in some way. Um, and so what we did is we, we talked to these people where, where they're living now, and then we went to their childhood home and we tried to photograph it from their perspective. So what did we find out? So there's, uh, each of these conversations was very different and each had some different um, things that we could take away. There's also, of course, some kind of broad, broader themes that could be um, gleaned from the study. But I think it's the details and the particularities of each of the stories that are, are actually some of the more fascinating things. So this is the um, Oud Roadhouses and the Weissenhof Siedlung. Um, you can see the, the, the south facade here. Um, and um, what's important is the, the balcony. Um, of this row house. And this is, um, as you can see, the kind of uh, the balcony off of one of the bedrooms on the second floor. And this was the bedroom of our um, interlocutor, the person we spoke with during the interview. And it's the smallest bedroom in the house, but the one with the balcony. And we thought that was kind of curious. And so looking at the building from outside, I think what the architect was thinking about was the balcony as a canopy, perhaps, or a, a, perhaps a formal play on the south facade. But for Mr. Fassbender, um, this balcony was particularly meaningful because it was his, and because in the summer he could open his bedroom door, drag his mattress outside, and sleep under the stars. And so this kind of specificity of the story, the experience, the memory, as it is, gets married with the architecture is, I think, the one of the riches of, the, of this um, recording method and this documentation project. Um, this is uh, Mr. Fassbender's family album. You can see a photo of him and his mother. You can see him sitting at a desk. But you can also see a photo of the row house um, with slightly less vegetation than the previous slide. And you can see a photo to, um, just to the right here of him um, on his sled right in front of the uh, Mies van der Rohe housing block right across the street from his um, row house where he used to go um, sledding, obviously. But he also used to play hide and seek in the stairwells. Um, and he also used to set off firecrackers because the echo is particularly good. Um, so we got to see some of these photo albums. We also um, got to see some of the artifacts that the children, um, now seniors, had from the time. This is a, a particularly sweet little booklet that Hans Scharoun had made for Helga Zumpfe. So Helga was the youngest of the Schminke children. And um, Helga told us about how Scharoun had become quite a close friend of the family, both in the design process and the construction process. But also later on, he came to visit them um, quite regularly. And this is um, photos from one of the visits. So that's actually Sharoon um, and Helga um, playing and you know then drying off in the pond in front of the house. And this is a little booklet that me he made for her. And this is a photo from inside the house. Um, and unlike the kind of oud balcony that I spoke about earlier, um, Sharoon had designed specific things in the house with the children in mind. And so he designed these things here, which are little um, glass portholes. Um, and they're kind of set at the eye level of children. And each one of them was of a different color. So there was a purple one, a red one, an orange one. And Helga remembers running from door to door and looking at the world through the different colors, um, a memory she still finds very dear. And, and the house in itself is very, very dear to her. She still dreams about it. This is from Pesach, um, where we spoke to Mrs. Goron. Um, Pesach was extremely controversial when it first opened in the late 20s. Um, it was so controversial that the city refused to hook up the water supply, so it actually stood empty for years um, before people could occupy it. So it seemed so radical. But to Mrs. Goron, um, this housing development was actually really familiar. Her family had previously lived in Morocco. Um, and so to her, um, the kind of early modernist houses were um, something very comforting, something very familiar. 
not everybody we spoke with had um, super strong or super fond memories of their childhood homes. Um, this is from the Tugendhat Villa. Ernst Tugendhat had to leave um, with his family at the age of eight. He was, um, the family was uh, being driven out by the Nazis. And he ha doesn't have terribly strong or fond memories of the place. Um, he doesn't remember the interiors terribly well. Um, and he doesn't also have a fondness for the house, one could say. He found it quite ostentatious, quite grand um, for the small provincial town where it was built. What he does remember is playing um, in the garden, but also here on the terrace on the upper level, just off of his bedroom. Um, he would play in the sandbox, and he would listen for the sound of the car horn um, as his father was arriving home. And lastly, Giselle Moreau, um, who was, her family was one of the first to move into the Unité in Marseille, um, and she still lives in the building. So, so she's lived in the building her entire life. She only um, moved out to go to university, then she moved back and she's lived in a series of different apartments, and she's now living back in the apartment that her, her, um, her parents originally occupied um, since they have passed. But she feels so extremely close to the building and on, on a very kind of deep emotional level. Um, she told us the story of, um, this is on the rooftop of the Unité. Um, she was sunbathing with her friend on this um, concrete rock here, and um, she heard on the radio the news of Le Corbusier passing. And this was um, such an emotional experience for her because she was so attached to um, the building and so attached to, by extension, the architect that she felt somehow um, that the news was about her. Um, so we're, we're, we, have, we have this treasure trove of, of information um, and all of these stories that we've collected. Um, we're, we're working on, on publishing these in, in different ways. This is the cover of J&E, where, uh, where one of the photographs from the study is um, on the cover. And um, there will hopefully be a book and an exhibition coming out of this as well. So the, the next category of work is <coughs> domestic narratives. And that sort of, um, it, it grows out of a motivation on our part to tell stories through everyday spaces. Um, so whether we design a space from the perspective of a child or imagine scenarios for changing use, we're trying to embed idiosyncratic moments into domestic architecture. Um, so the, the first example of that that I would show is uh, what we call Friction Fit Library. We were hired by a curator, Udameta Bauer, to renovate her loft um, a long time ago. <laughs> and she has a tremendous, tremendous uh, collection of books. And we thought rather than build walls, we would find a way to let the books be the thing that divide up the space. And then more than that, we wanted the armature to hold the books to disappear as much as possible. So we designed the bookshelf to be as kind of razor thin as we could get away with. And we did a, a, quite an extensive series of structural tests to, to find kind of the thinnest aluminum that we, could, that we could use. And then because Uta is moving every five years, that's her lifestyle, um, we designed the whole thing to be friction fit so she could assemble it and disassemble it herself without any tools. And then the whole thing could just be flat packed and put in a shipping crate and sent on. Um, so this is the bookshelf in Cambridge, Massachusetts. After that, it went to London, England, and now it's in Singapore. Uh, so it's, it, it has kind of lived up to its promise in terms of being able to move, move around. But the project we most want to talk about or what we want to focus on is Sky House, which is a project we completed recently on Stony Lake, which is in the Kawarthas a couple of hours east of here. Um, so this was a commission that we received just after photographing the Tugendhat uh, Villa in Brno. Um, and so it was kind of top of mind, this idea of children's experiences growing up in domestic architecture. And so the, the clients have a, a young daughter. And we were really keen from the, from the first moment then to inclu include her as a client along with her parents to kind of try to give her an equal voice uh, in, in the project, and actually Sky House was the name she came up with for the, for the house, which is great. Um, you'll see a lot of blue, that's her favorite color, that's a no-brainer. Um, 
but also like like we're saying, little idiosyncratic moments that we tried to put in. So the the ramp there that goes up to the main entrance, and we wanted to have a ramp, and we wanted it to have a wood floor, so that when she leaves the city and she arrives at the cottage, the first thing she hears is her feet pounding on the wood boards. And we're hoping that that instantly recalls like docks, summertime, cottage, you know, out of the city, away in the country, relaxing. Um, we did, uh, in a couple places in the house, we scattered these, these colorful coat hooks in different sizes that could kind of grow up with her as she grows, but also maybe form an abstract um, playing surface for, for a game she might invent. Uh, we made a little warm nook next to the fireplace where she could curl up with her dog. Um, her, the bed is the, her bed is the width of her room so she can have like maximum sleepovers. Um, and then we, we designed a, a custom swing bench which we put under the house um, kind of intentionally away from her parents, maybe as she's now getting into her tween years. Maybe it's a little place she can like go to escape the parents, don't tell them. Um, and of course, you know, the, the parents had some ideas too of what they wanted. And, and really chief among them was an idea of, of strict separation between entertaining and sleeping. And that was like a, a big driving force uh, behind the project. So um, taking this, this idea of the two, the two main functions, the living and the sleeping, we decided to, um, to use those as a kind of a guide, guideline for us in terms of the design of the massing. Um, so you can see the site is quite, uh, you can't really see it there, but yeah, there, okay, sort of. Um, it's a quite steep site, and what we inherited with the site was a kind of a predetermined site boundary, so we could build within that. Um, and the program then gets split into these two volumes. The lower volume shown here gets um, kind of nestled into the ground. We dug in as deep as possible without doing any Canadian shield blasting. Um, and the upper volume then goes perpendicular with kind of a minimal connection between the two. Um, and what this allows is for the upper volume to be kind of oriented towards the lake, maximizing the view there. But it also allows a kind of a passage underneath. Um, and that passage um, is for people, so you can walk down to the lake, but is also good in terms of thinking of the hydrology of the site and how the water kind of flows down the hill. And maybe the last um, move in terms of the massing is um, as we were kind of considering the daylighting of the upper volume, we designed a series of skylights, vertical skylights, um, to allow daylight to access that volume there. And you can see in the last move, um, those skylights have been rotated um, to face directly due north, um, which then you'll see the, the kind of effects of that decision on the interior um, as we go inside. <laughs> um, so there's a number of kind of uh, passive um, passive uh, moves to try to minimize the ecological impact of the house. And this is, of course, considering the fact that it's a second home, so you can only minimize as much as you can. Um, but um, nevertheless, we tried to be um, as ecologically friendly as possible. So there was the kind of orientation moves that I talked about, um, thinking of the water, thinking of um, daylight and um, heat gain and heat loss. Um, and then we tried to so minimize and then make up the difference with more ecological um, technologies, um, solar panels, radiant heating, etc. And here you can see the relationship between the two volumes. So the lower one kind of nestled in the ground and the upper one spanning, bridging, and then cantilevering to the side. And then the two volumes um, are, are different in terms of function, and therefore we wanted to make their experience quite different as well. So the lower one you see is, is a series of smaller spaces. It's more cellular. Um, and we wanted those spaces to feel quite warm, um, quite kind of comfortable and, and cozy. And so the, the material palette reflects that. There's birch plywood that's then been clear coated, a kind of a warm colored concrete floor as well. And on the upper volume, what we were aiming for is a much more open and bright and light um, space. And so you can kind of see the kind of openness of the plan, um, the continuity of the views, um, and then the materiality corresponds to that. So it's also concrete floors. Uh, here they're stained. 
a darker color, but the, the plywood on the walls gets um, painted white and that kind of helps to reflect and, um, and emphasize all of the daylight. And here you can see the, also the, the roof line as it is experienced on the inside. That kind of rational twist for the northern exposure um, then creates a kind of a sculptural ceiling. And the continuous views as you look down the house um, and out towards the forest um, or out towards the lake. And we tried to have a little bit of fun with colors too, and the bathrooms are all different colors and things like that. And you can see up above the kind of series of vertical skylights and the view out towards the lake. And the house as it is from the lake looking back. So the, um, the, the third category of work and the, <clears throat> the last thing we'll talk about today is what we call social infrastructures. Um, <clears throat> and so, so since what, what we're kind of interested in and, and where the phrase social infrastructure comes from is I think we're, it's fair to say we're living in, a, in an age of pronounced disunity. Um, and we're looking to create physical experiences where people can, can meet each other in public space, um, maybe by accident. And I think that's, that's important, uh, especially today, because at, at the same time, or maybe the two are quite related, um, I think, of course, we still have public space, but more and more often, we're, you know, historically, you would come together in public space, and that's where you might meet people with differing worldviews, people from different backgrounds, people who weren't quite like you, and you could kind of recognize their humanity and kind of understand that actually we all, of course, have much more in common than what sets us apart. And now we still have public space, we still go to public spaces, but I think we are getting, and I'm absolutely as guilty of this as everyone else, we're distracted by our mobile technologies. So we're together, but we're not together. And so we've been trying to very consciously to make a, a series of interventions in public space to just get people to interact with one another. And it doesn't matter, it, it doesn't have to get very deep. It can be <laughs> just surface, but, but I think there's something to recognizing each other's humanity that only comes from kind of a face-to-face -face contact. And, and for us, maybe in particular because we're living in the United States, it feels, there's a bit of an urgency to it, it, it feels. Um, so that's played out in a number of different ways. Um, this is a, a temporary installation in a festival setting. This is at the uh, Jardin de Métis, or, or Refford Gardens in Grand Matisse, uh, Quebec. The, the International Garden Festival happens every year. It's a, it's a big open international competition. We were, after a series of, of attempts, lucky enough to, to finally win one of the gardens in 2014, and then even luckier to be invited back every year since to remake the garden. Um, and so we've, we've sort of taken advantage of that each year to, to rethink it, to redesign it. So it actually started the first year it was purely horizontal and now it's entirely vertical and it's coming back again uh, this summer. Um, and, and then, we, so that's a kind of a festival setting out in the countryside and we think these ideas start to bear a little more fruit as they move into the space of the city. And so growing out of our experience at, at Métis, we were uh, actually commissioned by the Jardin and the Museum of Civilization in Quebec City to install something related to that on uh, the roof of, of the Moshe Softy building that the museum occupies. Um, so we made a play on, on kind of his roof lines to, to adapt the garden to that setting. But what we were very excited about is that that kind of brought it into a more urban setting where people would be more likely to accidentally come across it because this is, this is a roof that is publicly accessible. Um, uh, in in Safdi's design, there's, there's a staircase that leads all the way from the front to the back of the building over the roof and you don't need a ticket or, or anything to get there, which is wonderful. Uh, it's a really nice design move. Um, and then uh, some more views of that. And then, uh, and then we think it, it really starts getting even more interesting when it moves like downtown proper, when it becomes really urban. And so this, this is something in Toronto. So this is on King Street. Um, this is part of, we understand it's maybe a, quite a controversial pedestrianization of part of King Street. 
Um, but we wanted to make a, we proposed a, a sculpture, an abstract sculpture that people wouldn't know what to do with and could do whatever they wanted with. So it can be a seat, it can be a jungle gym, uh, it can be a place to lock your bike. Uh, but it but it's mostly just was an attempt to kind of occupy the space of the street and give it to the pedestrian, make it clear that that space was for them, uh, for them now. And so another view of that. And so with these installations, um, often what we use is, is familiar prompts, so things that people could recognize quite easily, um, that they would find quite approachable, um, that they would potentially know what to do with, um, and therefore they might approach the installation in a different way and, and know that they're meant to interact with it in some way. Um, so one example of this is sound cones. Um, this is a project we did at the, um, in the reading um, garden at the Cleveland Public Library. Um, and what the project is, is a series of, um, they're kind of interlocked, intertwined sound cones um, in pairs. Um, so you, you know, you have 10 of them, you don't know which one is connected to which, and you, you can, you have to figure it out if you want to use the thing, and so you don't necessarily know who you're talking to. Um, but the, pr the, the aim was to kind of, with this very simple prompt and maybe a little bit the brightness of the color, um, to single that, uh, sig uh, signal that this was meant to be interacted with and played with. And um, we're not claiming that one would have necessarily serious political discussions using our prompt, um, but it might, might spark um, an interaction with a stranger that one might otherwise not have. Another um, prompt, familiar prompt that we've been using is swings. Um, this is a project that we actually tried to install in Toronto a couple of years back, but weren't able to for various insurance reasons. Um, but this is called Hook Up. It's a series of seven swings that are tethered one to the next. Um, and um, swings, obviously people see swings, they know what to do with swings. Um, most people like to swing. Um, but what we were interested in here was that this kind of idea that one would have to negotiate and have some form of dialogue to be able to sw swing with others. Um, so even if you like the person you're swinging with, you kind of have to <laughs> coordinate that experience and it becomes um, even more interesting if there's more of you. So the, the last project we want to talk about today is Full Circle. And so this is another swing project. And it really grew out of a very, very simple premise. We just thought, if you think of a playground and you think of the swing set, everybody's kind of swinging one next to the other, uh, eyes forward, kind of in your own space. And so we just thought, what, what would happen if you took that experience and you arranged it in a circle? How would that change things? And so, of course, the first thing is you have to choose. Do I swing in? Do I swing out? If you swing in, you're really forced very physically to confront the other people that you're swinging with and interact with them in that way. Um, and then, of course, there is also a, a, a real element of or a perceived danger that comes with swinging quickly towards somebody swinging toward you. And, and of course, we designed it that you wouldn't collide. But, but there's a bit of fun in feeling like you might. Um, and we also liked somehow the, the idea, I mean, of course, a circle is a, a, a very primal shape, but that we were working with like playground equipment, something that is all about children, but then somehow marrying it with this seating arrangement that is maybe more typically associated with adults. So like yeah, a lot of parliaments in the world are organized in a circle. A lot of boardrooms have circles, uh, round tables. Of course, the knights of the round table. Um, and so just this kind of mashup, this hopefully playful mashup of, of taking children's equipment but positioning it firmly in an adult world. And so the, the project is on Buffalo's west side. It was commissioned by CS1 Curatorial Projects and SEPA Gallery. And it's, it was really interesting for us to be able to install it on Buffalo's west side because it's a historically disadvantaged community. It receives um, very little funding in terms of its public spaces or green spaces. Um, so it's a, uh, we felt, you know, we, we didn't choose to put it there, but we were happy to put it there because they, they could use kind of anything in, in public space to, to clearly signal, 
yeah, you can hang out here because so it's an empty lot and um, there are a lot of empty lots in Buffalo. And of course people hang out on them. They're, they become a public space, but it's, it takes on this dimension of you're not meant to be there. So to be able to operate on an empty lot and make it explicit that no welcome, you know, come, this is for you, you, you can be here, that w was really interesting um, for us. And what was also nice is since we installed it and talking, we've gotten to know some of the neighbors pretty well. And um, one of the things that we always suspected or hoped has actually um, proven true, which is that the, the swing is used as much by kids as by adults. So during the day, there's a, an elementary school across the street. It's, of course, well used by kids. But in the evenings, the teenagers take over. And then at night, there's a shift of adults. Um, we've even heard, but we haven't seen her yet, a goth girl who we're told comes twice a day, every day, doesn't matter if it's snowing or raining, and she swings. They, they think it's on her way to work and back, and she stops and always swings very angrily for 20 minutes with her headphones on. Um, but, but she's hard to photograph. They, we, we've asked the neighbors, and they've, they've tried, but we get these kind of blurry, blurry results. But it's a, it's a fantastic idea. It's everything that we wanted the project to be. Um, and then the, the project has actually taken, of course, taken on a, a life of its own. Uh, we're very gratified. It's become like on a very micro scale. It's become a miniature landmark. Um, we've bumped into people we don't know who say, oh, yeah, I always meet my friend. We're like, meet at the Pink Swings. Um, so these kind of things, that's wonderful, but we couldn't have planned for. Maybe more meaningfully, we recently were talking to people at the International Institute in Buffalo, which is a organization that helps to resettle refugees. So, of course, America is not doing anything like its fair share of refugee resettlement on an international scale. We, we're, we all know that. Um, Buffalo, in particular, is actually one of the three cities in America that per capita resettles more refugees than anywhere else in America. So it is actually a really big part of the urban landscape in Buffalo. And then the west side, as much as any other neighborhood, is really the epicenter of that. And that's where a, a very large portion of the refugees in Buffalo are getting resettled. And, and that's where the International Institute comes in. And what was interesting for us, and what we never um, could have planned for, um, but we were very happy to hear, is that things like this, like what we've done with Full Circle for the International Institute is exactly in line with their mission and they're exactly the kind of interventions they want to see at this kind of small uh, neighborhood level because it just provides something really normal for people to do. Long-term residents, newly arrived uh, residents, they can come together, they can swing, they can kind of see that each other is swinging and doing something normal and that they have that in common. And it's just a very, 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 very small part, but a, I guess an important part in the kind of resettlement process. And that, you know, if we can accidentally play a role in that, that's, that's wonderful, of course. Um, so projects like Full Circle are, are interesting to us um, on several levels. Um, they're interesting as maybe objects, but maybe where they become more interesting is um, as a way of thinking about the city. Um, and so uh, we're influenced by Van, Aldo v uh, Van Eyck, who worked in Amsterdam after World War II and, and was able to create over 700 playgrounds um, in the city there. Um, so thinking of these social infrastructures as, yes, fun and, yes, playful, um, but also as a kind of an, an amenity um, and as a different way of thinking about the city. So our kind of ideal would be to think of um, not, you know, 100 full circles in Buffalo, but <laughs> um, but 100 of these kind of playful interventions that um, provide a different look at the city and could become a kind of a different agenda for the way we think of, of urbanism and the occupation of urban spaces. Um, so those are our three categories, expanded preservation, domestic narratives, and social infrastructures. Um, we hope that we've kind of shown you the range of our interests from history and design and architecture and art and installation, um, landscape, placemaking, urbanism, um, through these kind of three categories. And um, I guess ultimately what we're interested in is, is 
the experiences that happen through these different forms of um, work that we um, that we do. We're interested in people, how they experience spaces, what they do in those spaces, how they remember those spaces, um, and we see our work in in whatever scale of ways, um, providing narratives, providing infrastructures for those experiences. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have some time for the public uh, to ask questions, if you have any. installation in Quebec, the rooftop installation, is it a permanent installation and what happens in the winter? Um, so it's a temporary permanent thing. <laughs> um, the, the framework was set up last year and it will be reused again this year for another version um, of the garden. Um, so that's the slightly more permanent side, um, but the, the barrier tape and the net will be changed. So that's the more temporary side. Um, and that's a kind of a, an, an attitude that we've used at the Métis Gardens as well, is we kind of over the years try to keep part, certain parts, the more kind of permanent, more labor intensive, um, stay in the ground and we reinstall using those as the infrastructure. And then the parts that change are the more, um, the more ephemeral. I have a quick question, I'm sure others do too, but thank you for your talk. I really appreciated the range of scales and kind of the, the variations on, I mean, there are three themes, but in a way we can kind of trace a line through, through all of the three themes. And, and one thing that's very clear to me is that you, the project doesn't end for you guys when the edifice is erected. Mm -hmm. That you seem to repeat, revisit each of these projects, all at these different scales to document their uses and how people engage with them. Can you talk a little bit about your process in that and when does the project end for you? <laughs> yeah. Do you want to take it? Um, yeah, it's not over till it's over, right? <laughs> um, until, it, until it disappears. Um, I guess then it's over. Yeah, I, I think really what, what Julia ended the talk with, that, that that's, that's really the part. It's only once it's finished or like, finished, ready, ready for use, that the project really begins. Uh, and we're really, really interested in the use and how people use it. And more than that, it's not even just the interaction of them with the thing, but it's actually the memories that that creates for them. And so they somehow walk away with, um, with the project in their head, um, which actually now that I say that out loud sounds horrible, uh, but I mean it in a kind of sincere way that I mean, it, everything we interact with cre creates memories, but I guess we're just, we're, we're really interested in acknowledging and, and trying to leverage our role in, in creating those. So in the last example, are you still in touch with the name? I mean, like the fact that you found out about this goth girl. Yeah. Like you're still in conversation hey, man, with the we, same Hey, we go there and pick up the garbage regularly. <laughs> so we're, you know, and the, and the neighbors that we become friendly yeah. with, they're always on their porch. So it's like, yeah. it's an easy, we, we always mm -hmm. pass them on the way in. One of them works at the local art supply store, so we also see her there all the time. Like, and, and we've gotten to know, you know, people through the project that way. But yeah, I guess we, we feel really kind of invested in, in the work that we do. And sometimes that's easier. So when you do a project in the city where you're living, you can go back to it and, and revisit it and, and have more of a conversation about it in different ways with different people. Um, sometimes it's harder, right? Like when you do a project somewhere else um, and, and you don't see it. And so you get, okay, you get an Instagram, you know, reminder of what other people are doing there, but that's not necessarily true or real. Um, I think our, our, the Growing Up Modern project is very much a kind of a critique of, of how we see architecture documented and um, talked about as this kind of pristine thing um, that's not always seen as something that's living and that's used. And then what we're trying to do with both the design projects and the documentation projects is to say that that matters, not just that it matters, but maybe it makes the architecture um, more interesting. So the kind of the pristine, the clean isn't always the, the most interesting. 
Yes. Hi, Corinne and Julia. Um, I have two small questions. Uh, I wanted to say that your projects really sparked joy, <laughs> and I would like more of them. So are you planning to do any um, social infrastructures in Toronto? And um, also about growing up modern, you briefly mentioned that uh, you will have an exhibition or a reception for the publication of the book. Where are you planning to hold that? <laughs> I wish I knew. Um, the, the book is in the book proposal stage, so it's not yet, we don't have a publisher, and we don't yet know where it will be published. Um, and we're hoping to, to, as we kind of process the interview materials, to, to be able to equally do a proposal for the exhibition. Um, the, when we visited the Weissenhof Siedlung, they seemed interested in hosting such an exhibition. So that was um, kind of interesting, because they still have people who have some kind of history to the place coming to visit, and obviously a whole bunch of architecture enthusiasts coming to visit. Um, but that's just kind of a little bit of a hopeful glimmer. Um, and in terms of the social infrastructure,